Hi, friends. We are here with an old friend of mine, Wael Farouk, whom I have known uh, since around about, gee, 2004, if not before. Uh, Wael is, as many of you already know, uh, a fabulous, fabulous pianist, a world-class pianist who has come through Spartanburg and come through Converse and uh, had a very close and important relationship with Kurt Zimmerle, who was, of course, the honoree of our upcoming Mosley Series concert. And Wael has joined me from his home in Delaware, correct? Yes. <laughs> Good, yeah, to talk about his career and about this upcoming concert uh, and about the fabulous, fabulous, fabulous piece that he is playing on the concert. So we'll leave that teaser there, but Wael, could you tell us a little bit first about your background as a musician? What was it that inspired you to play piano? How did you get started? What were the first steps? Uh, and were there any particular challenges along the way? Well, first of all, thank you for having me, Chris. And it's wonderful to be here. And it's always a very, very special occasion for me to be back in Spartanburg and particularly back at Converse and to play uh, with the on the Mosley series. Um, it's definitely um, a wonderful honor. And I'm looking forward to the second time playing on the Mosley series. So as you mentioned, I grew up in Cairo, Egypt, and uh, it is accurate. We've known each other since 2004. Um, growing up in Egypt in the 80s was a very interesting, wonderful experience. And um, as you know, um, I come from a Christian family, a Coptic family that my parents and their great, great, great grandparents are probably Christians all the way back to the you know time of Christ. And um, I started playing the piano around the age of three in a very unusual way as a form of therapy, hand therapy. I was born with a special hand condition that um, um, all my uh, finger ligaments are, are not uh, the normal length, so I was not able to make a fist till today, even to close my hand all the way, and I had um, no uh, feelings at all in, uh, in my three fingers, one, two, three on each hand, so I could not really feel anything with them, um, again, that's till today. So my parents noticed around the age of two and a half that I have very... Uh, a hard time holding on to anything, either a sippy cup or toys or whatever. I was dropping those uh, left and right. And then they didn't know also that I have uh, a very severe eye condition um, that I basically could not see anything past three feet. So, um, you know, I just sat quietly in a corner uh, all the time and they thought maybe there was something uh, else that's wrong or maybe my hand limitation were you know um, casting a, a, a shadow on my activities and my excitement as a child going around breaking things and snatching stuff and being you know a nuisance to everyone like most so in other words you were too easy a child to raise and you got worried <laughs> that's right and i probably should ask for brownie points now you know to for that transaction to be completed but anyway <laughs> so at at uh, two and a half or so I was taken to a hand surgeon who wisely told my parents you know do not do anything with his hand no surgeries no operations no injections he don't know why God gave him such a hand um, he was also a, a Coptic hand surgeon and I owe this man probably everything so my parents luckily listened they didn't seek a third and fourth and fifth and tenth opinions and they stuck with what they heard and um, but one advice the surgeon um, gave us that, you know, let, to let me exercise my hand, to use my hand in something natural or fun or whatever. So um, my parents were not musicians, but my dad somehow thought of maybe a toy piano will do the trick. And, you know, I just start twinkling on it. And uh, that's exactly what happens. And by the age of five, I could very much play almost anything I, I, I can hear on the radio and whatever. And I started playing at our church 
And from then on, some people who knew more about music than my parents or I suggested, you know, I should study professionally at the Cairo Conservatory. And we went and auditioned. And of course, at the beginning, I was not accepted, even though I scored the highest in ear training or, or you know, I could still play some Chopin pieces or whatever. I was kind of self-taught up till then, but they said, no, you will never be able to have a career as a pianist because you can't, you'll just, they told my dad, you will only cause your child pain and frustration and probably physical pain as well as psychological pain. So let him do anything else other than, than music. And my dad, who uh, knew nothing about music, but a lot about, you know, work ethic and, and logic said, well, if you say he's talented, Maybe you should give him a trial period, a grace period, and see if he really can do it or not. So um, I was seven and a half or so, and I stayed at the Cairo Conservatory for 14 years, and I graduated. And all of those professors who said, you know, he he's not fit to be a pianist, they come to my uh, Cairo Symphony concerts whenever I go back, and we are on wonderful terms, and they say, you know, we've never been so happy to be proven wrong before. So, hmm. wow. In a nutshell, yeah. So the piano study began as therapy, yeah, for what was looking to be some very difficult hand condition. So, right. at that time when you were studying in the Cairo Conservatory, may I ask, how large were your hands? As they make little hand gestures at my camera here. <laughs> uh, and right. Yeah. So at the moment, uh, right now I can reach an octave pretty well. I can reach a ninth, so nine keys, right? The length of the piano. If I put my thumb on C, I can go all the way to D, but I cannot play those together um, all the time. So when I was eight or nine, my hands were a lot smaller. I could only reach five or six keys. So I. The first time I could reach an octave, I was 15, which is pretty late. But uh, it worked at my advantage in many ways because I was able to drill a lot on, on technical studies and technical exercises, which became a project uh, of my book, couple of books project that I've been working on. And I will be talking about actually during my Converse trip uh, as part of the master class that having the smaller hand in, in many ways worked in my advantage because during these uh, technical drills installed um, a very firm foundation that is basically carrying me over till today. I feed off those uh, early training years till today and prevented me from experiencing any hand injuries, especially with the kind of repertoire that I play. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which, I mean, as a reminder to our audience, is usually stuff written by composers with famously large hands, like Rachmaninoff, uh, where they're expecting that the pianist is going to be able to span a wide range on the keyboard. Right. right. Now, how then did you, what took you from being a teenager in Cairo, who has managed to stretch his fingers to make a full octave, how then did you end up in Spartanburg, of all places? Right. Um, God's providence again. Uh, Doug Weeks, whom you know very well, um, who had a love and affinity to Cairo all his life. Um, in 1998, I believe it was the year, he uh, came to the Cairo Conservatory as a Fulbright uh, senior scholar. So he taught and lectured at the Cairo Conservatory for four months. And during that time, I was um, working on Rachmaninoff's third piano concerto. And he was also working on Rachmaninoff's third piano concerto. So he heard me practicing one day and very uh, warmly and kindly and, and uh, in a welcoming manner, he just opened the door, walked in, introduced himself and asked if I would play for him a little bit. And we instantly became um, I don't want to say friends back then because he was, you know, a teacher and I was still a, a student, but, you know, the best, the next best thing, um, and of course now we are wonderful friends and, and, and colleagues and Doug, as you know, 
you don't need more than 30 seconds till you really just feel like you know him all your life um and he said you know i teach um at this uh wonderful college and i also teach at this wonderful summer festival by the name of brevard uh would you be interested in coming um for a couple months to study and hear you know great musicians meet great colleagues and so on and so forth and i said sure wonderful yeah and um basically doug was my um my door to the States, my entry gate to the States, and I came to Brevard in uh, 2001, 2002, and 2003. And then Converse 2004 to study with him during my master's, of course. Yeah. Right, and you had, as I'm recalling, already had some study in Washington, D.C. as Correct. well. Correct. Point. Correct, uh, and that was also thanks to Doug because uh, Marilyn Neely, uh, probably you know the name uh she had um who was a great great pianist and a great teacher and her husband robert Purell was also a great violinist and from hungary and he was also involved at brevard for a long time but marilyn at that time she was not on the brevard piano faculty but she came for a couple weeks uh, during the summer to conduct a chamber music workshop at uh, converse so during those uh, trips, uh, Doug arranged for me to play for her. And uh, she said, well, uh, I'll be happy to, you know, have you work with me if, if things work out. So in 2003, I went to Washington, D.C. to study with Marilyn Neely on a Fulbright uh, Scholar Grant. And uh, that was a Catholic university. And it was a wonderful year. Uh, and then from there to Converse, Correct. And in your time at Converse, uh, you met your wife, Amy. Correct. Uh, and the two of you then went on to to Rutgers and in the New York area and thence to Chicago, correct? Uh, right. So not necessarily in that order. So after hmm. Amy was a senior and I was doing my first year mas master's. So Amy and graduated 2005, went to FSU for her master's while well, I had to stay behind and finish my second year at Converse. Then I went to New York one year and we had a two year long distance relationship and 2000, we both were done with our studies. We got married here in Delaware and we moved together to Chicago. And then I did my artist diploma at Roosevelt University where I also teach now. And then after that, I did my DMA at Rutgers. But while we're living in Chicago, I was commuting once a week via plane to Rutgers. Their stipend covered that. And then um, now, 15, 16 years later, we are back in this area again because my work on the East Coast at the Manhattan School of Music. So. Right, that you've just recently joined the faculty of the Manhattan School of Music. Correct. Yeah. which is very exciting stuff indeed. Thanks. So let, Thank let's you. talk now about this program that you have yeah. prepared yeah. for us uh, coming up here in just a couple of Mondays. Uh, tell us what you're performing. Right. So since you mentioned Court, if I may just back out a little bit, it was, um, of course, Doug is the main connection that I came to um, Converse study with, but Kurt Zimmerle, who was sponsoring the piano competition at Brevard, um, I met during my first trip with his wonderful wife, Nelly, and I do not need to say how much of friends they were to Converse and still are. So he invited Joe Hopkins, the dean at Converse uh, of the music school at the time, to come down to Brevard and to hear me play and meet and facilitate the future plan for me to come mm -hmm. to converse which you started this wonderful relationship as as you mentioned so when you so thoughtfully and so kindly reach out uh to me uh in the fall asking you know if i would uh play for court's memorial service on the um mostly series it took me a while to figure out what would be appropriate. Um, I've known Kurt and Nelly for a very long time. And, and they, they were, were people who recognized your talent 
but also were supportive in friends in a number of different ways, as I recall. Yes, exactly. And um, he was very special. And to know Kurt is really is to love Kurt. And he is very modest, both him and Nelly, very modest, very humble, very unassuming, and very generous. And um, it took me a while to figure out what would be appropriate, some of the pieces that he heard me play, this or that. But then I said, you know what, um, I've been wanting to play this, as you happily put it, a uh, magnificent piece, the Goldberg Variations, for a very long time, but I felt like I didn't have enough courage yet to play it publicly. So I've been studying it for a very, very long time. And I said, maybe this is, maybe this is a sign. And it's definitely an appropriate piece to, to play it as a, as as a gift or as a, a tribute to Kurt because it's wonderful, it's noble, it's uh, complicated, it's um, majestic and it's optimistic, it's mournful, it is, it just really has everything and I thought that will be really fitting. So uh, um, the Goldberg Variations, um, Bach didn't name them uh, the Goldberg Variations, but um, they were written the uh, uh, funny humorous story. Uh, Kaiserling, who was uh, the German ambassador to Russia uh, in the late 1730s, his court composer and court musician, the 14-year-old prodigy by uh, by the name Gottlieb Goldberg, Johann Gottlieb Goldberg, who happened to be a student of J.S. Bach. And uh, Kaiserling suffered from insomnia. And whenever he would have, you know, one of those rough nights, he would ask um, Goldberg to come in and play for him. And probably ran out of material very soon because he had to play for him almost every night. So uh, Kaiserling thought maybe it will be appropriate to commission from the great Johann Sebastian Bach a work that will be soothing, lullabying, however you want to describe it. And at the same time, um, has but has enough materials that, you know, not after two or three nights of, of, of playing 10, 20 minutes that you will get bored and, and, and recycle everything again. So you have enough materials for a week or a month of supply, uh, enough supply, let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. So um, Bach uh, wrote those uh, 30 variations on an aria that a very beautiful, but also very simple aria that happened to be in the Anna Magdalena book. And those variations are following a very specific order. Bach, as, as you know, he was uh, obsessed with numerology and he was a master structure and uh, master architect so you have the aria which consists of 32 measures and it has 32 notes in the bass line and every single variation exactly has 32 measures and the aria comes again at the beginning so 30 variations was the aria book ending them we end up with the number again 32 but much more than that, every third variation is a canon. And the canon, not the weapon, is, is the repetition of the melody a half bar later or, or a full mm -hmm. bar later. And yeah, Bach's... so one, one voice, quote unquote, in the, in the keyboard is chasing another one along. It is... Ex exactly, exactly. Um, and the first canon, which comes on on the third variation is a canon on the same note and the sixth variation is a canon on the second and then on the ninth and, I mean on the third on the fourth all the way till the um, till the interval of the ninth while Bach preserving exactly the same harmonic progression of these 32 measures and there are only three minor variations uh, and the whole 30 variations, and it's just an amazing piece. And what I will say for our audience members, for our friends who are listening to all of this and going, whoa, this sounds way over my pay grade. This sounds like too much for me to understand. 
it can be fascinating to understand these things and know how they work, but you do not need to know this stuff at all it, to be fully transported on the journey of this piece. Uh, for a classical musician, I myself am not an analytical listener. I tend to kind of shut off my brain and go with it. Uh, and this piece, I find, as you said earlier, it encapsulates all of life. It's got joy. Mm -hmm. It's got mm -hmm. sorrow. Uh, it's it's got sort of sublimity. Mm -hmm. uh, it's got day to day, you know, like there's yeah. sort of dance, lots of dancing stuff going on in it. There is absolutely every aspect of life packed exactly. into these 30 variations. Uh, and it's possible to experience this really interesting analytical listening experience as you're tracing the theme uh, and as you're tracing these canons as they develop over the course of the piece. But it's possible to just kind of shut your brain off and go with it and feel in a different way that you have had this totally, totally sort of encompassing artistic experience. Exactly. Uh, Bach was a was a formidable dancer, which not many people know, and, and he loved writing dance forms, as we all musicians know, all the suites and partitas are really just dances, compl um, completion of dances, and he was able to combine his his secular and his uh, sacred worlds together, all of his uh, instrumental music that he wrote outside the church has the spiritual component and also all of his church music has the 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 dance and joyful element um, in it. Even the 30th variation, which he titled uh, Quad Libet, um, or in a rough translation, As You Like It, uh, it's actually it's made up of three folk tunes and it's almost it's a beer beer drinking song and that shows also Bach uh, the human the, the the fun loving and you know um, it's like the human body in a way when you see a person you know their facial expressions you know what they mean you understand their body language you don't have to know every molecule where it, what is it made of every muscle every vein every name of all of that to appreciate the human body but when you do when you do you are more amazed and you are more in awe and you appreciate the human body more but you can still communicate you can still get a lot of uh connection that way without really being a, a medical student yeah yeah uh, and so this was a piece to be clear that was originally written for harpsichord mm -hmm. which looks roughly like the piano but which yeah. makes sound in a very different way the piano mm -hmm. makes sound by a hammer that strikes a string right. and the harder you press the key the harder the hammer strikes the string the louder mm -hmm. the sound is the harpsichord Correct. makes sound in a different way by plucking and it doesn't matter if you press the key hard or press the key soft, it plucks in the same dynamic. So what are the things that are an especially interesting <clears throat> challenge for you as a pianist playing music that was written for the harpsichord? Right. A great question. And uh, one of the things that I really attribute to my studies in the States and doing research and to be able to go beyond locking yourself up in a practice room for eight or nine hours. Bach really, ex with his massive output for the keyboard, he only specified three pieces that they should be played on the harpsichord only. And the rest is just for keyboard. That could be clavichord, harpsichord, organ, or the, the early version of the modern piano. But uh, the Goldberg variation and the Italian concerto and the French partita are the only three pieces that Bach um, recommended that they would be played on a harpsichord with two manuals. Not necessarily for the sonority of the sound, but so you can use a lot of hand crossing, but also to get differences in dynamic in the italian concerto of course it's a piece 
for solo keyboard, even though it has the title concerto in it, but it was composed as a homage for Vivaldi, who was a master of writing, um, you know, violent concertos, concerto grossos, etc., and Bach respected and admired very much. So he will have Bach captured for the first time the orchestral sound and the soloistic sound only with one instrument, and he would indicate forte which that means you play on the lower manual will ha have a louder sound and piano which will play on the you will play then on the upper manual which will have slightly softer sound for the goldberg variations i think uh, his choice of recommendation of the harpsichord was more for the hand crossing and he was very much inspired by scarlatti a great italian master who lived in spain for a long time and uh his beautiful sonatas are full of hand crossing at least in his early age um, by the end of scarlatti's life the rumor goes that he loved the spanish food so much that he wasn't able to, <laughs> to cross his hand over due to his you know um overweight um, but anyway that's for another conversation so in this aspect Crossing hands a lot on the piano and often hands will fight over playing the same note. That is a bit um, challenging, but you find ways to work around it. However, I find the piano, I studied the harpsichord before and the clavichord and, and the organ and the forte piano. Uh, it is wonderful experience to play all of them. And I think you get a better understanding of the rhythm articulation and the, the sound style in general for playing Baroque music or early 18th century. But I also find the piano encompasses all of these instruments and in a wonderful way able to, not to imitate, but able to provide the same results, emotional and um, statistical results as, as these are instruments. If you know what you are doing and if you are able to, to handle it well, um, the piano has a beautiful tone and, and I find it actually very fitting for the, the long, beautiful line that Bach has. It's almost vocal line rather than, than instrumental. And I know woodwinds, players and singers are always complaining that Bach doesn't allow them, you know, rooms to breathe because his lines are just going endlessly and i feel the the piano is able to do good justice for that so. and the, the 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 upshot of this mm -hmm. for a pianist playing this music since the music was written for an instrument where the dynamics <clears throat> are largely out of the player's control and the attack is largely out of the player's control yeah. bach doesn't write in those instructions for you Unlike, say, Beethoven or Chopin or Rachmaninoff, where there are a lot of instructions. So that means that you are the pianist. Yeah. You, as the pianist, are, are the one who is looking at that variation and determining yeah. by the character of the melody, harmony, the rhythms, yeah. what type of attack to use and what yeah. type of dynamics to be using, when to be getting a little bit louder, uh, whether or not to apply pedal. All of those things are things that uh, are questions where you, as a pianist, are making determinations that the composer doesn't specify. Exactly, and I think that's one of the most liberating things about playing Bach, if, if you know that this is what you're expected to do, especially with with all the repeats, each, each uh, variation is in binary form, so it consists of an A section and, and B section, and Bach asks you to repeat the A section, so you play twice, and the B section, to repeat it as well, so you play it twice. And I'm taking all the repeats. So it's basically 60 variations, not really 30, but the liberating thing about doing the repeats that in the second time, you can almost play it as if it's an entirely different piece, just by adding different ornamentation, different articulations, different dynamics, showing different voicings, because even on the simplest variation, Bach still has a lot of polyphony and a lot of counter, but multi-voices rather than just here is the melody, 
here is the accompaniment bomb chuck chuck and just you know enjoy it something for you to whistle or whatever it's a lot more integrated and com complex and and wonderfully um elaborate so taking the repeat and of course it gives you a chance to play it better second time <laughs> but taking the repeat it's like hearing okay here is another angle here as if you're looking through a kaleidoscope uh, through this magnificent piece and Bach does this almost through all of his works all of the suites all of the partitas they recommend for you to take the repeat so you can do something different second time now I feel like I could really have a great time talking about this for the rest of the afternoon but I will ask just one last question about this and it will be kind of a long question though uh, for many of our friends, you're familiar with this piece, very possibly because you're familiar with the Glenn Gould recording. The pianist, Canadian pianist Glenn Gould kind of burst onto the classical music scene in, I believe, 1950, I should have looked this up, some point in the late 50s. 50, like, 57, yeah. 57, okay, thanks. Yeah, uh, with a recording of uh, on piano of the Goldberg Variations, uh, which... Uh, were known as a teaching piece to some extent before before then, uh, but this recording became a sensation uh, and was a bestseller and a bestseller not in the little classical music part of the record store, but it was competing with Elvis songs and things like that. Like, like literally millions of people bought this recording. And then at the end of his career, he re-recorded using digital technology, the Goldberg Variations. And so his career was bookended by these million selling recordings of the Goldberg Variations. Uh, and so American pianists, one of the things that I know they find challenging with this piece mm -hmm. is that in a way they probably knew the Gould recordings before they knew that they knew the Gould recordings. They were just sort of in the air. Uh, and so dealing with a lot of the artistic choices, you know, it's hard to do when you have this template that is already sort of lodged in the back of your mind. Growing up in Egypt and having spent the bulk of your training there, do you come to this piece with that same sort of relationship with the Gould recordings or with any other recordings? Or did you feel like you were able to bring a little bit of a clean slate to, uh, to it when you started to, to interpret this? Great question. Um, interestingly enough, when I was uh, around the age of 12, I studied with this great, great Russian teacher. Uh, we had many Russian teachers in, in Cairo, Egypt, and that had to do with the Cold War. And, you know, Russia was supporting Egypt at the time, the U.S. supporting Israel, and etc. So we had many Russian uh, musicians or ballet dancers. We also had Italians and Hungarians, all of this at the Cairo Conservatory. The Italians taught solfege, the Hungarians taught formal analysis and conducting, etc. And the Russians taught piano, violin, and uh, ballet and cello. So <clears throat> my teacher at the time was a student of Neuhaus, who also taught Richter and Gilles, and they were his classmates, happened to be at this historic um, concerts that Glenn Gould did in Russia in 1957. And in a way, because of Gould's uh, Goldberg variation, of course, and some people start calling them now the Goldberg variations. And because his Russian trip, he really gained his, his um, as, as you said, it just like rocket launching um, career in the 50s. And my teacher at that time, he went to those concerts that Gould did in, 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 in Moscow. And he was saying, you know, the first concert, a whole program of Bach, nobody was interested, was maybe 30 or 40 people at the, at the, in the recital hall. But by intermission, uh, people just went insane, basically. And they couldn't believe what they were hearing, and they went out phoning their friends. Uh, when the second half started, the, the, the entire hall was full. And that's the hall in the, in the Moscow Conservatory, the Great Hall of the Moscow Conservatory. And his 
the rest of us for recitals and 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 master were sold out because people realized this is an amazing genius and really no nobody thought of Bach the same way afterwards not just in terms of keyboard but in general it was almost like what Mendelssohn did for Bach in the 19th century Gould by reviving Bach again that was almost going into oblivion because he was considered to be very difficult very complex very old school Gould did the same thing so now studying with with this Russian teacher in the 90s he had collections of Gould recordings and he said you know after a long day of teaching I go home and I clean my ears by listening to Glenn Gould so he said well here you know listen and I didn't hear the Goldberg variation he didn't have the recording of that I had some concertos I heard some um, other solo pieces but it was unmistakable what this uh, great man has done and the sound of the piano and the sound of 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 his polyphony and how he's bringing out all the voices and and the emotional intensity of Bach I did not hear the Goldberg variation by Glenn Gould till I moved to the States because to be honest, growing up in Egypt, we didn't have much access to recordings, to scores even. So, um, and even when I moved to the States, there was no YouTube yet, but from the Converse library, I checked out the, the Gould recordings and both of them and I heard, but I wasn't surprised or I wasn't familiar because I heard the style before, but usually to answer your question after this long circle, when I hear recordings, I don't hear them in order to be, I don't go with uh, the state of mind that I'm ready to be influenced. I, I go to them and I want to see what this man has to say about them and, and in what way and what can I learn from that in my own way rather than just to copy. And that's sometimes the danger of recordings. You are too obsessed, especially if you hear only one recording, you're too obsessed with it and subconsciously you end up copying it. I think it's with, with Horvitz, for example, or hearing some of the great uh, romantic pianists who play mostly romantic repertoire, it is, you can get away with imitating them and you don't sound like a really fake second copy. But with Gould, it's impossible to imitate him because he arrives with such conviction. He has this amazing technique, amazing articulation, and amazing persona that it just it doesn't fit. It doesn't work on anyone else other than Gould. And I think that's why he decided to do it, to re-record it again. And what he did in the second time is very different than the first time. Usually when I study a piece, or even without preparing to study the piece I spend I spend all my money on records and, and scores and all of that and it's important for me to keep listening and keep learning from these great artists but um, I heard other records of course that were available of the Goldberg variations to see if I am going to contribute something to this piece or say something that haven't been before I need to be aware of what already been out there if I'm going to make a contribution um, what Gould did uh, in the first recording he really put that piece on the map it was the first recording ever to be done of the Goldberg variation but he himself in an interview about the 1985 uh, version he said the first recordings was very nice was wonderful but more in an early romantic conservatory approach there were no temporal relationships between the variations it sounds like 30 wonderful but separate pieces and what he was trying to do in the second recording other than having the new technology of adobe or stereo or that trying to find a common thread between each of the 30 like you know a beautiful Nicholas of Pearls. Um, so 
to answer your question, I guess, I don't feel like I suffered from the Glenn Gould uh, influence or the Glenn Gould uh, charisma so much, especially with that piece. And partially also because I decided to play late in life. Maybe if I, if, if I was playing it 20 or 25 years ago, I might have had a different approach to it. But taking the time and, and reaching my conclusions, not just based on recordings, but on analysis and studies and reading. For example, what C.P. Ebach said about playing keyboard instruments or what Leopold Mozart said about, you know, playing a uh, strings instrument or what Kvan said about playing, you know, um, wind instruments. Basically, they're saying the same thing about uh, aesthetics of music, about beauty of music, about being expressive, about uh, articulation about dynamic, about being free, and about being a co-composer in a way. Mm. So, if that answers your question. It does, and I think that what to me is so exciting about this concert, we'll be hearing you, we'll be hearing this piece that I myself love so much, but that I can't think of a better tribute to Kurt than to have you performing these pieces. Uh, and Kurt is somebody who meant so much to Spartanburg for so long, who did so much for our town's cultural life for such a long time uh, that I'm so deeply delighted to be able to host this tribute to him in the form of you playing this wonderful, wonderful piece. So I'm so grateful to you that you'll be able to come and join us. By the way, friends, uh, while y'all will be sticking around through the week working with our piano students at Converse, uh, and then finally on Thursday evening, that's Thursday the 29th of September, if it's at 7.30, we'll be soloist in a free concert by the Converse Symphony. We'll be playing the Chopin first piano concerto. Uh, they'll be doing, oh, the second piano concerto. Sorry about that. But you are also right. The, the second piano concerto is he... He composed it first, but he chose to publish it second because he was more mature when he wrote the first. He wanted to be more grand, but now it's referred to as... Yeah, that, that's what I was getting at all along. <laughs> okay. <of> course, right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, but anyway, it, that also is going to be a fabulous concert. The orchestra is playing Stravinsky's Pulcinella Suite to go with that. Uh, so it should be a wonderful program. So we hope that you'll join us on Monday, September 26th at Daniel Recital Hall for uh, a performance of Box Goldberg by Variations by Wael, Wael Farouk, uh, and then on Thursday, September 29th, in uh, the Twitchell, Twitchell, Twitchell Auditorium at Zimmerly Performing Arts Center uh, for Wael's performance with the Converse Symphony of Chopin's second or first, depending on who you ask, <laughs> piano concerto. So Wael, thank you so much for joining me this afternoon and talking, and I can't wait to see you when you get here to Spartanburg soon. Thank you so much, Chris, for the invitation and for this con wonderful conversations, and I look forward to seeing you as well. Thank you. A total pleasure.